Well, today's project is perfect for those of you that have indoor cats. We're going to show you step-by-step -step instructions on how to build this cat outhouse. Now the cats can do their business outside of the house and the cat owner now has easy access to litter pan cleanup. So what we decided to do was go ahead and build a prototype out of cardboard to make sure our cat house idea was going to work. When it's finished, it's going to be made of wood walls and a shingled roof to protect it from the elements. This cardboard prototype worked out perfect. It gives us a good reference point with our measurements, gives us a real size dimension of how things are going to work, and gives us a chance to experiment with. Now the first thing you're going to need to make this happen is a safe and secure pet door. Now there's a lot of varieties of pet doors. You can put it in a sliding glass door, an exterior wall. That's up to you. For us, we built our own sliding glass door pet panel, and we'll show you how that worked. Now for you at home, all you need is some time, materials, some power tools and hand tools, and watch us and we'll show you how to build your own kitty cat outhouse. The first thing we're going to build for this cat house is going to be the actual drawer for the litter box because the drawer is going to determine the actual width of the lower part of the cat house. Now this pan is 16 and a half inches by 22 and a half inches. So we want the base to be three quarters of an inch wider and longer than the pan. So that'll give us 18 inches by 24 inches. And it just so happens that this is already cut at 18 inches. So we're gonna go ahead and cross cut this at 24 inches. For this cut, we're gonna use the table saw. And we have it measured 24 inches from the inside of the blade to the fence. So we're gonna go ahead and put on our safety glasses, make it safe, and cut some wood. At times, I might speed up the video for basic procedures. So the drawer front is going to be also 18 inches wide by 16 inches high. So I'm going to cut that while I'm here too. Next, with our drawer base, I'm going to go ahead and wrap the perimeter with 1x3 pine. Now I already cut two at 24 inches and I have those on the two sides. I went ahead and measured the inside here and came up with 16 and 3 eighths of an inch. So next, I'm going to grab my piece of wood measure 16 and 3 eighths, and cut two of these for the front and the back. Give it a cut and make sure it fits. Now that we have our front, back, and two sides cut, let's go ahead and flip over our drawer base and make some measurements. We're going to put an inch and 5 eighths screw into the 1x3 through the half inch plywood. So let's make some marks, front and back at 2 inches, 9 inches, and 16 inches. And on the sides, 2 inches, 12 inches, and 22 inches. That gives us a screw in the center and 2 inches in from each end. Then we're going to go ahead and grab our handy dandy little bit, which actually has a pilot and a countersink for our inch and 5 eighths drywall screw. Make a mark at 3 eighths, and with your pencil and your finger, keep that same distance and slide across the end of the wood. Now go ahead and drill your pilot hole and countersink for your screws. Notice I used the front, back, and sides of the actual drawer to hold the piece of plywood off the bench to make drilling easier. Okay, now that we have it all cleaned up, let's go ahead and attach some wood together. Now with this Craftsman bit, it's pretty cool. It reverses, so you can actually take it out, reverse it, and pop in a driver for your screw. Next, we want to go ahead and grab some glue and put a nice even bead along the wood. Then go ahead and line it up. And starting from one end, make sure it's flush on both sides. Grab your screw and drive it home. Make sure each screw is countersunk and then go back with a wet rag and always clean up your glue. It's not necessary to glue every piece of the cat house together, but since the drawer will be used a lot, I thought the glue will make it stronger for longer. And again, go back and clean up all that glue while it's wet. Now for added support, I'm gonna put just one screw in the center of where the sides meet the front and the back. Next, let's go ahead and attach the front to the drawer. Now this is gonna be attached with a lot of glue and some screws, two on either side. Well, there you go, instant drawer. 
Okay, let's do some mathematics. With our drawer hardware, we're using a bottom mount drawer glide, and the specifications call for 7 sixteenths of an inch in between the actual drawer and the opening on both sides. So we're going to give it 7 sixteenths of an inch all the way around. So you go ahead, take 7 sixteenths times 2, that's 7 eighths, plus your width of your drawer, which is 17 and 7 eighths, add 7 eighths, you get 18 and 3 quarters of a width. The height is 16 inches, plus 7 eighths, gives you 16 and 7 eighths. So we're going to go ahead and lay out the side of our cat outhouse with those measurements. Now whenever we're doing custom work, it's always a great idea to lay it out on a template. And we did that using half inch plywood. So this will also act as the wall when we're done. So we took our drawer measurement, the space that we talked about, and the framing of this is going to be two by four, cut down an inch and a half by inch and a half. So we went ahead and transferred all of our measurements onto this half inch piece of ply, and now we're going to go ahead and cut it down. Now the overall width of our drawer wall is going to be 21 and 7 eighths. So let's get started cutting that. Make sure you cut off the scrap and not part of your template. Set your circular saw blade to cut all the way through, plus a quarter of an inch, and then freehand cut your angles of the roof. Now take your template and trace it to a new piece of plywood. Make sure all of your lines are dark and easy to read. Now with your one and a half inch by one and a half inch piece of pine, make a mark at three and a half inches and transfer that mark on all four sides. Put your leg on that mark, flush it up to the end of the panel. Now trace the underside of the leg. Now flip it over and darken down your mark. With this extreme angle, I had to carefully freehand it on the table saw. Now attach your legs to the panels. We'll use inch and 5 eighths drywall screws, at least three on each side. Double check to make sure everything is on its marks. Remember, measure twice, cut once. Use a quick grip to help stand it up. It makes the floor beam easier to install. Now that we have our legs mounted to the side panels, we're ready for our next step. And that is to go ahead and cut two pieces of one and a half by one and a half by 38 and a half inches. What that's going to do is when put in place, it's going to give us an outside dimension of 42 and a half inches. So let's go ahead and install those now. After your screw is in, you should have a nice snug fit. For this pilot hole, start it straight and then angle it in nice and slow. And come back and put in your screw. Now measuring from the plywood to plywood on the inside, on the bottom, we got 41 and a half inches. Now that I have the ridge beam cut at 41 and a half inches, let's go ahead and install that at the top of our roof. Notice I have these quick grip clamps which act as an excellent temporary shelf to help installation. I already went ahead and did my pilot holes, so I'm going to go ahead and flush out the corner of the ridge beam with the top of the angles of the roof and go ahead and screw it in. Mark your wall beam height about an inch down from the angle of the roof and then make that same exact measurement from the bottom up all the way around. Now we'll double check the length of our floor beam and make two more just like it. Install these wall beams the exact same way as the floor beams. Now measure between the two legs on the wall. Get that measurement, double check both sides, and then cut both floor supports. At times, I like to cut it just a hair bigger. It makes insulation a little easier to knock it right in place. Then grab your quick grips, line it up, make it flush to the bottom, and then screw it in. For the roof support, just measure from the tip of the angle to the corner of the ridge beam and make two square cuts. That'll be fine. Now to attach it, just go through the same procedure. Use your quick grips, flush it up, and put a couple screws in. A 
Let's go ahead and put in our floor. We went ahead and measured the inside dimensions, 22 inches by 42 and a half inches. Then on a piece of half inch plywood, we went ahead and ripped it down on the table saw at 22 inches. Then cross cut it with a circular saw at 42 and a half inches. Then came back with the jigsaw and we went ahead and jigsawed out the corners to fit inside of our framework. Now let's go ahead and put it in. As you can see, I cut things to an exact fit or maybe just a hair bigger. I like a nice snug fit. And remember, if it's too tight, you can always cut a little bit off. Now finish up your floor with putting three screws on each side. Perfect. We're now ready for our next step. We put a piece of framing at the top of the drawer opening at 16 and 7 eighths. Now this framework is actually going to act as a guide for our bottom bearing router bit. We'll go ahead and drill a hole big enough for the router bit to get in and then we'll go ahead and router it out along our new guide. Make sure your router bit is low enough to cut through your plywood. And your drill bit needs to be wider than the router bit. Now drill your hole in the inside corner of the upper right. Put your router in and router in a clockwise formation. Always make sure the router bit is tight against your guide. I like to go around twice. It cleans up the edge real nice. I have a habit of always double checking all of my measurements. Well that worked out real nice. We went ahead and put a couple pieces of framing on top of the floor which added support and also gave a place for the hardware to attach to. We tested the drawer, everything works out real nice. Now we just tacked it with a couple screws because all the hardware is going to come off for our final paint job. But now let's go ahead, cut our side panels and then we can go ahead and cut our screened openings for either side as well as our entrance door. I went ahead and cut the two side panels at 23 and 3 quarters wide by 42 and a half long. And then I got my clamps and used this again as a shelf so I can go ahead, grab my piece, pop it up here. I already made my pilot holes. Now I'm going to come on back with my drill motor and put it in. These panels were cut to the exact width so they should flush up on either end. To secure these two side walls, I'm using inch and 5 8 drywall screws. These openings we're about to cut will allow for light and air circulation. Now that our wall panels are installed, let's go ahead and cut out our screened open areas. We decided to go with an 18 inch wide, 4 inch high opening. This will be centered off the side of the panel and 12 and a half inches off of the bottom. Now what you want to do, after you sketch it out, is grab a drill motor big enough for your jigsaw blade. Go ahead and drill out just the inside corner of all four corners. Then come on back with your jigsaw and cut it out real clean. Measure from the bottom up at 12 and a half inches. With a straight edge, draw your line. Now measure up 16 and a half inches. Make two marks and draw your line. When sketching out this opening, I'm going to work off the center, which is at 21 and a quarter of an inch. So I'll make a mark and then measure nine inches off of that mark on both sides to get my 18 inch opening. Now I'll double check my 18 inch opening. Now I'll connect the dots. With your drill motor, drill out all of the four inside corners. Now with your jigsaw, cut out that opening so it's nice and clean. And make sure you go back and square up your corners. Now every cat house and pet door is probably going to be at different heights and locations. So make sure you get a good measurement of where your pet door and cat house line up. In our case, the opening will be centered at 9 inches coming 6 inches off the ground, topping off at 14 inches. Now measure up from the bottom of each leg at 6 inches and make a mark. Connect the dots with a straight edge. Now measure up 14 inches from the bottom of each leg. Draw your line. Now find your center of the wall, make a mark, and then we're going to measure 4.5 inches off of either side of that mark to give us a 9 inch wide opening. Now with your framing square, box out those marks. 
Now drill out those inside four corners, come back with your jigsaw, and jig it out real nice. Make sure you clean up your corners. When you can, go back and clean up your cuts with some sandpaper. Now both of our roof panels are cut. 45 and a half inches by 24 and a quarter inch. Now I wanted to give them just a dry run to make sure they're gonna work real nice. So I grabbed the quick grips, went ahead, clamped it down to the ridge beam, and just put a couple tack screws in to hold it. And then we went ahead and gave ourselves an inch and a half, hanging over, each side and it worked out perfect. So now we're ready for our next step and that is to remove these two panels, remove our drawer hardware, give the whole unit inside and out a good sand, and then we'll put a coat of primer on the whole unit. At this point I went ahead and sanded down the whole unit front, back, top and bottom, inside and out, with some 80 grit sandpaper first and then finished it off with some 120 grit sandpaper. Now that it's all dusted off, I want to go back with some joint compound and this is actually going to go ahead and hide all the imperfections like the screw holes and maybe anywhere on the seams. We went ahead and filled all of our holes and seams with some joint compound, better known as spackle. Then we went back with a nice light sand so the whole unit top, bottom, front and back is sanded including our tops and our drawer. Now what we want to do is go ahead and cover up our legs with some blue tape because we're going to go back and stain those later. We don't want paint on those. The paint that we're going to use for the primer is my favorite, Kilt's Primer. I'm going to use a hot dog roller and cut in our corners. So let's get started. All except for the outside of the roof panels and the legs, we gave every surface, top and bottom, inside and out, a thick coat of primer. After your primer dries, smooth every surface out with some 220 grit sandpaper and give it a good cleaning. We now have the cat house dust free, so we're ready for our next step, and that is to apply some white latex caulk into the corners. Applying a very healthy bead of caulk is very important. It'll help keep those unwanted solids and liquids out of the corners. When applying the caulk, it's great to have a sponge and a little bucket of water. It helps you smooth out the caulk in the corners with your finger and gives you easy cleanup. Notice I take the time to make sure every corner has a very generous bead of caulk. Now that your caulk is dried, give every inside surface, top and bottom of the house and the drawer three coats of white semi-gloss latex paint. For the exterior paint, I only want that on the exterior. So I'll grab some blue tape and mask off the insides of the openings of the house and the outside of the drawer front. Now that you have the house and drawer masked off, you're now ready for some exterior paint. We painted the outside of the cat house with three coats of exterior green paint, which happened to match the exterior of our house. Now let's take a look at our exterior trim. To prep our trim for our installation, we'll sand, stain, and polyurethane it before we put it on. With your 220 grit sandpaper, give every piece a nice smooth sand. Next, make sure your working area is dust free. Today, we're going to use Minowax wood stain. I like to give it a good stir, make sure all the stuff is off the bottom, grab a clean rag, dip the rag in the stain, and then give yourself an even coat over all the pieces of trim front and back. I like to use a foam brush to get that stain in the grooves. Some trim has a lot of detail, so it might be easier to start with your foam brush and then finish with your rag. Make sure you inspect all of your pieces before you seal it up with your polyurethane. I like to apply the exterior polyurethane again with a foam brush. It puts on a nice even coat. To start with, we'll do the tops and the sides and then when that dries, we'll flip it over and give the back a nice clean coat. Well, it looks like the first coat came out real nice. But to the touch, you can feel the dried up dust particles on the polyurethane. To smooth that out, we'll use 320 grit sandpaper. Fold that in half. Use your saw to cut it. Then fold that in half. Dip in water and very gingerly smooth out those particles. After you're done buffing out all those particles, make sure each piece is free of debris. Follow this process for the second coat of polyurethane, but with your third, don't sand it, leave it shine. For our next step, let's install our leveling glides. What we're going to do is take off the blue painter's tape, find the center of the bottom of the leg, and then we're going to make a mark. 
We're gonna come back and drill a pilot hole with our 3 16 inch drill bit, and then finish it up with a 3 8 inch drill bit, and that's the width of the shank. Drilled about maybe an inch and a half deep, we'll go ahead and hammer this in lightly, and then we're all set. First, remove your blue painter's tape. Now, find your center by drawing a line from corner to corner on both sides. Next, drill a pilot hole with your 3 16 inch bit. Finish your hole with that 3 8 inch bit going at least an inch and 3 quarters deep. Now install your adjustable floor glide. Let's do it one more time. Find your center, drill your pilot hole, finish with your 3 8 inch bit, and then pop in your unit. The opening for our window screens earlier were cut 4 inches by 18 inches. So what we have here is some heavy gauge nylon screen, and we're going to cut that a half inch bigger all the way around. So that'll be 5 inches by 19 inches. So we'll go ahead and cut those and then install. With a framing square, cut two adjacent sides to give yourself a square start. With a golden sharpie, measure down 5 inches on both sides. Give that a nice clean cut. Now measure over 19 inches on the top and bottom. Make that cut and you're ready for installation. Now on the top corner of the window, measure up and over a half inch on both sides. Anchor a top corner with a staple, pull it across tight, anchor that, make sure it's on its mark, then pull down and across, keeping the screen tight. Get started with your trim by giving yourself a clean 45 degree miter. I'm going to burn an inch to get an accurate measurement, and that just means to start the beginning of the cut at 1 inch, and then I'll measure over to 19 inches to get my 18 inch width. Double check your angle and cut the line off. On your next piece, again, clean up the edge. Now line up your trim back to back, flush with one edge, and make a mark. Double check your angle and make a cut. Now for your vertical piece, make a mark at 4 inches. Double check your angle and make the cut. Again, lay your pieces back to back, flush to one edge, and make a mark. Check your angle and make the cut. With a 16th inch bit, I will drill pilot holes for the nails. The six penny nails are too long and will stick out on the inside of the cabinet. So with your wire strippers, go ahead and cut those nails in half. Now very carefully, get those nails started in the pilot holes. If measured and cut properly, it should line up perfectly on the inside of the window. Then nail it in. Now follow this procedure for the trim around the two windows and the entranceway. At times, you may need to put a nail in the corners to lock them up. When we measure our entrance, it appears we have 9 inches by 7 and 7 eighths. Always take the time to cut your pieces with accuracy. Measure twice and cut once. After the trim is installed, you should have a nice snug fit. Don't worry if you nick up the green paint. You can always go back and touch it up. I think the wood trim on this project is very nice. It gives it a bit of a traditional look. After all the pieces are in, go back with your nail punch and send those nails home. With the base molding, we can actually use the full six penny nail since we're going into more meat. It won't stick out on the other side. We'll do this procedure the same exact way. Cut your pieces, make sure they fit, then go around and nail them in. Make sure that all your corners are real tight and when it's all done, it'll look real nice. It's now time to reattach our drawer hardware. Just go ahead and find the old holes. And now, give it a test. Perfect. Okay, now that our drawer hardware is installed, let's go ahead and take a look at the molding that's gonna cap off the front of this. We have this inch and three quarter molding. So we're gonna have that molding protrude one inch past all the way around. So we'll make a mark at three quarters of an inch on the front of the drawer, and that'll give us a guide to go by for cutting and installing. Now, on the adjacent sides of all four corners, Make a mark at 3 quarters of an inch. When you're done, you should have 8 marks. With your framing square, connect the dots, 
and give yourself a nice light pencil line. Don't make it too proud. With your tape measure, burn that inch and get your measurements. Again, take your time to get the correct measurements and angles and cut all four pieces. We will nail this drawer trim in the same way as the rest, but double check to make sure you have your short nails for the top three moldings and you can use the longer nails for the bottom piece. When nailing a project like this, it's always good to have it on a nice sturdy workbench. Now will be a good time to install the handle since we have no way to open the door. Notice I went ahead and centered it about 4 inches down from the top. With your 16th inch bit and drill motor, drill 4 pilot holes. Mount your handle with all 4 screws that came with it. To blend those screws in, I'll use a black sharpie and darken them down. We turn the cat house on its side to make the legs a lot easier to finish. To get started, let's remove the adjustable floor glide. Now give it a good sand with your 220 grit sandpaper. After all four legs are sanded and dust free, protect the underside of the cat house with blue tape on all four sides of each leg. With your stain and a clean rag, apply yourself a nice even coat on all four legs. Now that the stain is dried, we're going to give ourselves a nice healthy coat of polyurethane and we'll give it three coats total. It's now time for the cat outhouse removable roof. What we did is built this interior structure which fits on the inside and then the roof panels and shingles will go on top. So let me show you how we built this structure. Let's go ahead and measure up 28 and a half inches from the bottom of the house on both sides. And this will give us a reference point for our straight edge that we're going to go ahead and clamp on. Put the clamps on the lower end of the bat stock. Tighten it up. Now that we have that, grab your half inch plywood, piece of cake. You put it up there, find out where you like it, grab your sharp pencil, and go ahead and scribe both sides. Now set your circular saw depth to cut a quarter inch below the bottom of the plywood. Lay down two pieces of scrap to cut on top of. Take your time to get some nice straight cuts. Use that new cut piece as a pattern, scrap it to your plywood, and go ahead and cut your second piece. Next, measure the inside of the interior of the roof from framework to framework. Looks to be 38 and a half inches. 38 and a half inches minus a half inch for the plywood times two minus a quarter of an inch for spacing. That gives us 37 and a quarter. Use your speed square as a fence and cut yourself four pieces. To avoid confusion, mark T for the top of your triangles. Now take those 37 and a quarter inch spreaders and screw those in between the half inch triangles. Make sure they follow the angle on the outside and flush to the bottom. This removable roof will fit around the inch and a half by inch and a half existing ridge beam. So for now, we'll grab a piece of scrap, line it up to the top, Scribe it and cut it out. Do this procedure for both sides. Make sure you clean up your corners real nice. It's always nice to double check it to make sure it fits. Measure down an inch and three eighths and make a mark. That mark will be your reference point to the top of the spreaders. I like to use those quick rips as temporary supports while screwing. For this application, we just used inch and five eighths drywall screws. Now that we have all of our pieces built and painted, Let's go ahead and put together our removable roof. Our next step is to put that unit in place and screw it to the ridge beam. Slip it in place, put it where you like it, and grab your quick grips and clamp it down to your ridge beam. Before you screw it in place, make sure you have that eighth inch gap on both sides. Line up your draw angle to go perpendicular to the center of the spreader. This interchangeable bit is great. Not only does it drill a pilot hole and countersink, but also switches so it can be your driver. For this application, use a 3 inch drywall screw. Put 3 to 4 screws in each spreader on either side. Make sure you don't tighten it down too much. 7 to 8 screws from the ridge beam to the spreader may be a bit overkill, but since I have the time and I've got the screws, I'm going to make it happen. Now make marks on the roof panel so you have equal distance from the panel to the house on both sides. Put the panel on its marks to the top of the roof and clamp it down. 
Now measure down from the top of the roof to the middle of the spreader and go ahead and make a mark so you can tack it in. From the end of the roof panel to the beginning of the spreader, we have about four and a half inches. When measuring down from the top, we have about two and three quarters to five and five eighths. On the lower spreader, it goes from 13 and a quarter to about 15 and seven eighths. I transferred those marks to the outside of the roof panels. That's gonna give me an excellent reference to screw the panels to the actual spreaders. After you tack it into place, make sure you like it, and then go ahead and put your screws in. For this application, I'm using inch and a quarter screws. It never hurts to go back and measure twice. Now find your screw that attaches the wall to the ridge beam and unscrew it on both sides. So now that we took out those two screws on either side into our ridge beam, we are ready to remove our roof. Let's see if it works. Perfect. We decided to cut 3 quarter inch by 3 quarter inch pine and that's going to pack out the soffit and the gable end. These pieces have already been primered and painted with three coats. Now that we have our 3 quarter inch by 3 quarter inch cut and painted, we're ready to install. We're going to go ahead and wrap the inside perimeter of the roof and this is going to serve two purposes. This wood is going to give us something to nail to for our drip edge as well as when you lift this off, you have something to grab onto. Start with the clean edge, get your measurement, Transfer that measurement, cut your piece, put it up there with your quick grips, and screw it in. To start with a gable, grab your piece, butt it up to the newly installed soffit piece, and scrub your line. Cut the angle on your saw, clamp it down, and screw it in. Do the exact same thing with the other side. Line it up, make your mark, cut it, clamp it, Screw it. You can do this procedure for both gable ends. We're now ready for our roofing application. We're going to go ahead and start with our 15 pound felt paper, cut it wide, staple it on with some 3 8 staples, and then trim off the excess. Next, we'll come back with our drip edge, and that's going to go ahead and outline the whole perimeter of the roof. You start your roofing project, make sure you have your 3 quarter and 5 8 inch roofing nails, 3 8 inch staples, a stapler, a hammer, tin snips, a razor blade, and a hook blade. Start by rolling out your tar paper and make a measurement and cut your tar paper wider than your roof. Let that tar paper overhang on both sides but flush it up to the bottom. Now put enough staples in it so the tar paper doesn't go anywhere. Trim off that excess tar paper with your razor blade. Cut your other piece of tar paper, put it on the other side, flush it up to the bottom, make sure it overhangs and staple it in. You can now trim your tar paper and use the side of the roof as your guide. When we measure for our drip edge, we come up with 45 and a half inches. Make a mark on your drip edge and give it a nice square cut. If the cut doesn't go all the way through, wiggle it back and forth a couple times and it'll break. Flush your drip edge up to the end and use your 5 8 inch nails to nail it in. You can put a nail on each end and a couple in the middle. For the gable end, line up your drip edge to the piece you just installed, get your mark on where the top of the roof is. Mark it and cut the side facing the camera. Put it on, see how it looks. And apparently we need to cut a little more of the angle so it'll fall into place. So far, it's looking good. Fold the drip edge into place and then make a mark at the top and at the bottom where the metal meets. And that'll give you a nice vertical line to cut to. Now put it in place and make your mark on the bottom and then cut that off. You're now ready to nail it in. Today we're going to use the Timberline Ultra HD architectural shingles with a copper canyon color. So for whatever shingles you decide to choose, make sure you follow the manufacturer's instructions. For our architectural design shingles, I'm going to walk you through how that works. To get our starter row, we're going to cut the top tab off of the shingle. Flip your shingle over, and with your hook blade, cut along the seam. Whenever using a razor blade, make sure your hand is not behind the blade just in case you slip. The height of our starter row looks to be about six and three quarters of an inch. With your white wax pencil, make a mark at five and three quarters on both sides, draw a line, and this will allow your shingle to overhang on the bottom one inch. Our shingles are 39 inches wide, so measure over 38 inches, make a mark top and bottom, draw a line, and that will allow this row to hang over one inch. Now nail it in with your five eighth inch roofing nails. To finish this row, we're going to cut a piece at 7 and 9 sixteenths plus an inch, which will be 8 and 9 sixteenths. Make sure you like it and then nail it. 
For our next row, we're going to cut 6 inches off of the end. Now measure from the end of the shingle, 33 inches, and make a mark. To transfer that measurement to the top, just measure over 32 inches. And then draw a line. These shingles are 13 and a quarter inch high, so measure up from the bottom of the existing starter row, 13 and a quarter inch, and make your mark, and draw a line. These shingles require four nails, approximately one an inch and a half in from the end, and one 12 inches in from the end on both sides. For our next cut, we have 13 and 5 eighths plus an inch, which would be 14 and 5 eighths. Always make your cuts so the factory ends meet. We will start our next row by trimming 11 inches off from the rake end of the first shingle. Now, from the end of the shingle, measure in 28 inches. This will give you 27 inches from the end of the roof. Make that mark on the top and draw a line. These shingles have an exposure of 5 and 5 eighths. So you have that plus 13 and a quarter, and that gives you 18 and 7 eighths. So measure up from the bottom of the starter row, 18 and 7 eighths, make your marks and draw a line. Now line up your shingle to that mark and nail it in. The next piece is 18 and 11 sixteenths plus an inch, 19 and 11 sixteenths. After cutting these shingles a couple times, I find that the framing square is an excellent guide for cutting. To start our next row, I'm going to cut 17 inches off of the end of the shingle. Now measure in 21 inches from the end of the roof. Draw your line. Measure up 18 and 7 eighths from your last run of shingles. Make your marks and draw a line. Now hammer that next piece in using your reference lines. Our last piece of this row measured out at 25 and 3 quarters. Cut that baby and nail it in. I hammer all my nails above that white line in the middle of the shingle. The next row we can start out with a full piece. In this case we'll just measure up 5 and 5 eighths to give you that exposure. Our last piece for this side measures out at 8 and 13 sixteenths. So I measure from my factory edge over 8 and 13 sixteenths, make a mark and cut it. You can do this shingle application the exact same way on the other side. For our top tabs, we'll go ahead and measure 12 inches from the end of the shingle. Cut that, turn it over, and just give yourself a small little angle cut on both sides of the top. This is a great time to use your scrap. Just make sure you have a nice clean cut edge. Make yourself enough tabs to span across the whole top. Center your tabs on the top of the roof and nail it in with your 3 quarter inch roofing nails. Keep the same distance all the way across up from your last row. To finish your roof capping, cut the black part off of the tab. Nail it in. The nails are exposed, so just dab it with some clear caulk. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining us on our Cat Outhouse building project. On one of our next videos, we'll go ahead and show you how to build that cat panel door. My name is Eddie Rainier, and we'll see you next time.